It's my great uh, pleasure and honor to introduce um, our moderator and panelists for this session, um, the first for today for the symposium, Black African Nations Toward Unity, Bantu, Education, Community, and Abolition. Um, the panel will be, uh, will, <laughs> will be moderated by uh, Professor Margaret Burnham, who is the University Distinguished Professor of Law at Northeastern University um, and a renowned uh, attorney uh, and legal scholar. Uh, we will hear from Albert Brown, who was a member of the NPRA and Bantu in Walpole in 1973, um, along with uh, Jabir Pope, who we will also be hearing from. Uh, both were wrongfully convicted and spent 40 years in prison for a crime they didn't commit um, and were recently uh, exonerated um, and, and came home. Uh, Kazi Toure is a longtime community activist, um, an activist, uh, organizer, uh, and revolutionary on, on both sides of the wall, um, bringing that experience to this conversation. David Dance um, is uh, a alum of Harvard College and the Phillips Brooks House Association, um, who was connected to some of the events that we are commemorating the 50th anniversary of with this symposium. Um, he was also director of programs at Phillips Brooks House Association uh, for many years. Um, and Jabir Pope, uh, who I mentioned before, um, at the time of the Walpole takeover, was involved in the Concord Prisoners Peaceful Movement um, at MCI Concord. So please uh, join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Thomas. It's a, it's a great honor to be here uh, and to participate in this uh, utterly historic event. Um, so uh, good people, we're in for a wonderful uh, conversation with the, those who participated in, uh, in a, a, uh, an event 50 years ago uh, here in Walpole at the prison in Walpole here in Massachusetts, uh, and, a, and an event uh, and a series of events, a series of, organ of organizing endeavors uh, that raise the question of why prisons uh, and whether uh, prisons were serving their purpose or whether indeed they should be abolished long before that discourse and that word uh, came into our uh, common conversations. Uh, so these are participants in those events, the, the folks who framed the um, intellectual and cultural and educational context uh, for the events which took place here in Massachusetts. And so it is, I was here, but not, not, not a participant. All of us on this panel are long in the teeth. Uh, and so we, we start with that. Uh, we start with that and with the, uh, with the experiences that come with having been around for now 50 year, more than 50 years. So it is my honor to introduce uh, first those who participated and built Bantu, uh, which was a sister organization to MPRA. And uh, we'll hear about those developments uh, from Jabir and from Albert, and as well from David, uh, whose uh, educational leadership uh, in Walpole was so uh, central and critical to the, to the, to the foundation uh, and to the work of Bantu and ultimately also NPRA and, and the revolt that they both, the, both of those organizations led. So let's start with, with Albert. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for being here. Um, am I uh, Bantu? Um, I wasn't a, uh, I was a member of Bantu. I wasn't a board of director of Bantu. I was a board of director of NPRA. But, but I do know that Bantu was essential because it was the first time that people of color in Walpole had a chance to be introduced to their culture. We knew nothing about our culture. We knew nothing about our history. Um, 
And so we got there and we were thrown in this in this situation and running around like chickens with our heads cut off. Because there is no book, one-on-one playbook on how to do time or how to be in prison. And this was at a really, really tough time. So you had to either find your way or connect with uh, a situation. The situation was band two for us. But band two, they saw the need for us to, um, one, get in touch with our culture, two, to unify people of color in Walpole, because Walpole was a very dangerous person, a place. We had to get together to survive. We had to come together to survive. And, you know, there were law classes taught by, by, by paralegals or inmate uh, uh, people working in, in the uh, law library. There was, you know, we did all kind of uh, 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 things together. Education was important because nobody even had a GED. Uh, and pop, uh, I think Walpole's population for people of color was 10%. So most of those guys, nobody had a GED. So we had to get people to school. We had to get uh, Walpole to recognize that we had people who wanted to go to school because they weren't set up for that. So, you know, their answer really was, we're about security. If you want programs, you all are going to have to do it. And that's exactly what Ralph and Bobby and, and, uh, and uh, you know, that we did. We, we fashioned uh, all of our programs. Ani was one of them. Uh, he, was, he was a education guru. And uh, he was big on education, and he was very, very helpful in raising up some of the young brothers um, to go to school. Thank you so. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for, for those those remarks, uh, uh, Albert. And uh, as you say, in Walpole, uh, back in the 1970s, the African American population was just 10 percent of the prison. So this was a small small number of brothers, about 50 in total, and a prison population of about 500. Uh, and so they found themselves, um, they'll speak for themselves, but, but as I understand it, assaulted from uh, many, many, in many, many directions. Uh, and also just assaulted as learners, um, as students, uh, as uh, cultural uh, producers. Uh, all of this uh, was, um, was uh, subordinated and to denied uh, to this very small population of African American men uh, at Walpole. Uh, and they overcame that uh, and, uh, and, and created um, their own uh, universe uh, focused on black culture, black education, um, black dignity, black pride, uh, black spirituality, uh, Af the African roots of our, uh, of our culture. Uh, and all of that uh, came through this vehicle of, of uh, Bantu. So thanks so much for bringing your memories um, to the table and, uh, and to the room, uh, Albert. And now, uh, Jabia. Uh, good morning, one and all. Uh, my introduction to the state prison system began in 1972, when I was shot in the back by a Boston police officer. And they charged me with assault and battery on him and gave me five years, uh, sent me to Concord Reformatory. Where I joined the Peaceful Movement Committee, and in 1975 became the chairman of of, of that organization. Uh, the Peaceful Organ Peaceful Movement Committee was a result of came on the heels of of the uprising in Attica, and what followed from Attica was a legislative act called Chapter 777, which provided us with a mandate for rehabilitation. Uh, the mandate went as far as to say if, if the DOC failed to rehabilitate us, that we had the right to rehabilitate ourselves. And so that was the spirit under which the, uh, the Peaceful Movement Committee was, was formed, and that's what we strive for. There was a variety of uh, subcommittees under the, under the umbrella of, of the Peaceful Movement Committee. Um, which was about the business of educating prisoners um, to the politics because a lot of people don't realize that the politics as prisoners, politics hit, hit us first before it, it moves on to, to, the, to the general population. And so it was important for us to understand 
what we was governed by, what we was up against as it related to, to the politics and, and the prison system. We was also associated with other programs like, like Bantu and all the programs that was going on um, in Walpole at the time. At, in 1976, I wind up going to, to Walpole myself and joining that. Walpole at that time was the leading penitentiary in the country. What Walpole did, most prisons across the country followed. If Walpole went on strike, pretty much every prison in the country went on strike in solidarity with us. Um, in the Peaceful Movement Committee, our posture was always trying to do things peacefully, but a lot of times um, peaceful, peaceful sit-ins and, and like that resulted in state troopers coming in to the prison system and gassing us and, and removing us from ourselves and putting us in condemned conditions, uh, portions of the prisons that was all, all already condemned and then announcing to the public that we was enjoying hot meals and so forth and so on. Uh, so much for the credibility of the DOC and their association. Um, and then, as I said, in 1976, I went to Walpole where, uh, where I joined my, my brother down at the end, my Cody, and, and we it was about the business of educating those that came behind us, the youngsters. Um, I think it's important to note that, that as an individual, when my daughter was 13 years old, her little boyfriend was murdered on, on our steps, and I wasn't there to, to, to help, but I resolved in that moment that I could not ensure that my babies were safe until I could ensure that everybody's babies were safe. And so that's what inspired us to go about the work that we did in prison in terms of educating the youngsters that came behind us to, to the dangers of, of, uh, of prison and trying to make a contribution to, to the community at, at large with, with the works that we try to put together. And our strive was always to try to put together conscientious works and, and like that that would serve the community well inside as well as outside. Um, a glimpse of what you may get to see over the, over the lunch break, uh, um, God willing. And I'll rest on that for the moment. Thank you so much, uh, Jabir. Um, so uh, Bantu had its uh, start uh, with uh, inspired educators from this institution uh, who went into uh, Walpole and uh, began a uh, prisoner education project. Um, this was at a moment of uh, a, a turning in Massachusetts. Uh, as Jabir mentioned, uh, we had uh, 766 uh, on the books. 766 was really designed to uh, re reorient uh, prisons towards uh, towards um, education, uh, and, uh, and uh, rather than uh, punitive, the punitive uh, <clears throat> conditions um, that had prevailed uh, before the prison reform movement across the country, highlighted, of course, uh, by the re revolt at Attica, uh, but then also in uh, Rhode Island at ACI in Rhode Island, uh, and and ultimately uh, here in. Uh, Boston, in, in Massachusetts, at Walpole Prison. Um, so we're really, really, uh, uh, it's a real, real pleasure and honor to introduce um, David Dance, uh, who at the time was, uh, as you can see from your program, the Phillips Brooks House Association volunteer in 1973. And he'll tell us uh, about his time at Walpole. Uh, but before David speaks, I, I, I also want to say, uh, for those of you who were not here last night, um, that you know, much of this history uh, is recalled uh, in enormous detail, almost painful detail, I will say, in a book by, um, by uh, Jamie Bissonnette. Uh, the book is called When Prisons Ran Walpole. And she has done an utterly um, remarkable job of collecting all the memories and all the documents um, that pertain to 
uh, the prison reform and the prison revolt and the prison revolution movement here in Massachusetts from 19, I'd say 1970 uh, through 1978. Um, she starts her book uh, with, the, with the origin of prisons in Massachusetts, uh, but the focus of the work is really on those revolutionary years, the revolutionary 1970 years, um, when uh, folks began to uh, take their lives into their own hands uh, in Walpole and decide um, that there was a different way uh, to run a community and to run a prison. So um, with uh, gratitude for uh, Jamie's work, uh, I'll now ask David to say a little bit about his role. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, thank you. Um, we're on Harvard's campus, but I don't know how many people actually even know what Phil's Brooks House Association was, so I'm gonna kind of start there because um, it is a nonprofit, uh, 501c3 organization that exists uh, within the Harvard uh, framework, um, largely Harvard students, although it touches groups from outside and other campuses, but it is a public service organization. Um, it's had students who have gone into the prison since 1955, I believe, is when the first prison program goes. So that's a framework. Uh, Phyllis Brooks was a preacher um, in the turn of the last century, and when he passed away, actually, in the 1880s, they built this house, uh, Phyllis Brooks' house that sits in Harvard Yard to um, uh, continue the work that he did, philanthropic work at the time. But uh, we're talking about a very period of time, Cos will speak to this uh, more in a moment, of a very sort of revolutionary period of time that happened. I, I should say that Phyllis Brooks House runs a number of programs. They run a, a Harvard Square homeless shelter. Uh, they run a uh, youth homeless shelter. The students began uh, answering the call that there was no other um, place for, um, you know, for teens who are homeless to be housed and how that would happen and developing a framework for that, for, for that to happen here. We're in schools, within school programs, civics programs, um, science programs to uh, beef up the science programs in schools and whatnot, a number of programs like that. And also a lot of student advocacy. I've got Ed Childs in the room today who was just a union organizer um, on campus, uh, recognized the continuous power that students or young people in general have, what they bring to our movements. In many respects, students are sometimes the shock troops of movements, if you study social movements, for those who, are, uh, who do that. Um, but in the beginning of the 1970s, and I think this is really important to realize, the things that uh, Ralph Hamm was struggling with on this inside, trying to bring this uh, cultural support uh, to his brothers around him in the prisons and what that was like, um, African-American studies has been, um, had a struggle, wasn't born on Harvard's campus even without student protests, um, students demanding that the university develop an African-American studies program. And until relatively recently in the 50 years that we're talking about, right, um, that had been a, a struggle. So it wasn't always here the way, uh, the way people um, think it was. It was born out of the struggle as it was on many, many campuses. So our group of students coming out in, entered in 1970 in terms of the framework, and we were still struggling for this whole idea of um, cultural identity and just how to learn the things that we felt we needed to learn to be successful black men and women in, uh, in our communities and, uh, and just going forward and what that looked like. Um, I have to say, um, that even Harvard wasn't prepared to teach us everything that we needed to, to know, particularly given the nature of the work that we uh, wanted to pursue and whatnot. Um, I'll give a little personal just to, to show this. I went, I'm born in Boston, uh, and Boston is very unique. You talk about the 10% uh, of the prison population, but we've always been a very small uh, uh, percentage of the black folks, uh, of people in Boston. We've never had the political uh, clout that black folks have been able to have in other cities just because of the, their numbers uh, and whatnot. And that's sort of a very important thing to, as we sort of examine just uh, the context that we're in right now in terms of the coalitions that were built and extreme examples of how important it is to study uh, this book 
and this time period because Sankofa, African concept of looking back to the past to pick out those things that we feel uh, are most relevant to carry into the future is just a very important part of, uh, of just black culture. So let me, let me drill for a second, you know, just get um, uh, a little down in terms of just creating a black history cl you know, class on possibilities for the prisoners. Uh, when that contact was made, it wasn't even made through me, and I, I've been very candid with people. I think Ralph gives me far too much credit, but I just pulled together some materials and whatnot that they would be useful for uh, putting together a black history program within the, um, within the prison. And that got picked up on in a lot of things. Why this is so important, I think it's important for the people you know, in this room. You all are scholars. You're working on these issues to understand sort of where that whole piece of identity and the importance of it is. Um, there's a guy named Gilligan who was a clinical psychologist for, um, for the prisons for, in Massachusetts for better than 15 years. James Gilligan. James, James, um, he, uh, James Gilligan. I highly suggest people just to look at uh, both his book on violence and the second book in terms of when he deals with how do you get rid of violence in our society, right? And he points to the fact that, and somebody mentioned this in, you know, last night in terms of just the horrible stabbings that can happen and whatnot and why somebody would do what they do. From listening to prisoners, this clinical psychologist uh, took forward the message that they did it because somebody lowered their self-esteem so much that the only way they felt that they could come back from that was to do that violent act. And it's a very important concept. In his second book, he deals with the economics of just how uh, American society shames certain people in, in, you know, on the outside, and we continue to produce that and produce that because of the way our system functions if we, if we take that away. So I'll throw people back to those concepts because if we talk about abolishing prisons, it's an important concept to get that. You know. Um, how do we replace that? So it, it's just what is it replaced with uh, in terms of meeting people's needs to overcome some of these sort of very, very clinical situations that we find ourselves in? All of us, you know, just, you know, just in terms of just overcoming that. What are our value systems? Where do those value systems come from? So that's kind of what education is really all about, right? You know, in terms of just how we build community and community from the outside. This brother's going to uh, lead us in a revolutionary direction, <laughs> and I'd appreciate that. Um, and what I say is that part of our own education was students taking it on the same way prisoners did, in terms of we got to educate ourselves because it's not coming from any place else. Um, when I hit this campus after attending political education meetings with the Black Panther Party in Boston during that period of time, um, there were a number of people who hit campus with similar experiences from their cities and where they came from, and we started to take on uh, work as students in our community supporting programs of the Black Panther Party, which meant helping to man the free breakfast program here. Cornell West, if you know that name and whatnot, was part of a collective that I'm talking about. Mary Bassett, who's sitting in the room, worked heavily in terms of establishing um, a free medical clinic for the city of Boston, free dental clinic. Um, as a student back in those days, I can remember getting a call to sub in someplace because another student couldn't make it over and I was sitting in a dental van helping mix up fillings for people's teeth and whatnot. There's a free dentist that uh, Mary and others helped put together in the party, um, you know, began to do that work. So that's kind of the context of what we were offering and what students were doing sort of even beyond the Phyllis Brooks House Association. We needed things like transportation and whatnot, and Phyllis Brooks House had a couple of vans, so we, we utilized those to go you know, where we needed to go and whatnot. Um, uh, my political work at that period of time was driving the van for the Panther Party's Liberation School. It came off of this campus and whatnot, um, and those were Saturday classes and whatnot. So I, I'm, I'm saying all this to draw just context because things that happened very, very quickly. We lost, we lost Martin, we lost Malcolm, we lost um, uh, so many members of the Black Panther Party during that period of time. Yeah, all right. 28 youth. 28 yeah. youth during that period of time. Um, and all of us were seeing all these things. The only question is kind of um, how do we involve ourselves with that? And 
I really want to talk about what's the nature of uh, supporting others sort of doing the work because students were not in a position that prisons could be closed down at any point in time of uh, losing a, a whole program that may be, you know, 15 years in development, you know, because they just didn't want us in, right? And you see this kind of um, uh, mechanism used again and again and again for the prisoners during that period of time. They could shut your program down, deny access to families, you know, much less students and educators coming in from the outside. So I want to stop there. I'm sorry if I've been too long. Um, so. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks. So, thanks. Thanks. Th thanks so much, David. And, and I would urge everyone. Uh, thank you also for raising up um, uh, Ralph Ham for bringing Ralph into into our space. Uh, Ralph was a natural natural leader, a forceful leader, a uh, brilliant man uh, who uh, was able to uh, talk uh, across the blocks, as it were, at Walpole. Uh, get block four to talk to block nine, to, to block two to talk to block ten. Uh, very few people could do that, but he could do that um, and stay safe. So, uh, you know, obviously this was a collective affair, uh, but you need leadership, and uh, both, uh, uh, both Ralph and uh, Bobby DeLello, who we'll see later on today, uh, provided uh, just uh, just uh, amazing leadership. Um, they were aware of their times, aware of their own strength, aware of you know of the humanity of all of those uh, who were in the prison, and also just enormously talented negotiators because they had to negotiate with the guards. They had to work. Uh, with the uh, prison officials, they had to work with state uh, state leadership. They had to work with the with the press, uh, and they were uh, really able to do that. Um, just uh, to 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 say, well, we're here, uh, but we are going to uh, live full lot as lives that are as full as we possibly can make them while we're here. Uh, and um, so, just having that that vision, that imagination of how to create. Uh, a world within the bars uh, was just uh, was just um, just priceless. Um, so thank you uh, for bringing Ralph um, into our space today. Uh, so um, Kazi didn't spend any time behind the bars at Walpole, but he did spend a good chunk of time um, in uh, federal prison at uh, Kazi, um, uh, Leavenworth, Leavenworth, sorry, baby, um, Leavenworth. Um, and, but he's not going to talk to us about that today. But before Kazi um, shares with us um, what was going on in our communities uh, while uh, the folks behind the wall were organizing, uh, what you know? What were the tensions? What were the dynamics between um, uh, communities uh, across Massachusetts, but particularly here in Boston, uh, and what was happening in Walpole, Concord, and Norfolk? Um, but I also want to um, uh, let everyone here uh, know um, that Kazi's brother, Arnie King, uh, Arnie, would you mind? Could you stand up, please? Okay. Arnie King, Arnie King, all, all praises, all, all praises, all praises to this man. Arnie uh, was locked up in 1973, and uh, he rejoined us in 2021. 2021. And uh, again, talk about brilliance. Right there. That man. Thank you so much, Arnie. <laughs> Kazi, yeah. the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. And um, thank everybody. Thank you for inviting me to say a few words here and y'all for coming. Uh, all the workers who behind the scenes did the work to put this together because a lot of times they're not seen, you know. But we appreciate them. Uh, I'm a former political prisoner. I was locked up for seditious conspiracy, conspiring to overthrow this government. And I still feel that it needs to be overthrown for us to get free. Uh, 
like Margo said, I was I got out in '73, but my brother was in in '72. He was in Walpole 72. then. Yeah, he was in Walpole then in '72, and I started working with family friends of prisoners on the outside with Donna Finn and Ruth McCambridge and uh, John McGrath and a bunch of good people like that. And we drove the bus out to different prisons, did vigils, stood outside the prison, organized people to uh, be out there to witness what was going on inside and what they did, make sure that they didn't harm our people too much, you know, to do what we could. Um, but because life and everything is connected uh, and in constant motion, like David and some people were talking about, these events and things started in this period of time, uh, maybe three years before when uh, young Jonathan Jackson uh, went to free up his brother at the Marin County Courthouse. And from Jonathan, doing that act, and he took the judge and uh, some of the prisoners that were on trial and jury, and they tried to leave the court. And um, the guards and the police, local police, killed everyone there in that van, except for Rochelle McGee, who is still in prison today from back then. So everything's in constant motion. Uh, a year later, in two weeks, one year, two weeks later, they killed George in San Quentin. Two weeks after that, the Attica goes up. And Attica goes up, and like Jabir was saying, a lot of things were developed in Attica, um, and um, 43 people were killed by state police. They had Attica, 33 prisoners and 10 guards, and they were all killed by the state police bullets. They tried to blame it on the inmates. Like they always try to twist things around and make black people, new African people, brown people look like they're the ones that started it. They're the ones that's violent. But as we know, this country was took and stole from the Indians violently. We were brought here in the bottom of them ships violently. And the first, like I don't know, first year law students, Harvard probably know, fruit of a poisonous tree, that if anything is uh, born on a tank, everything that goes, follows that is poison. So we're dealing with something that is born on a tank. And as much reform as you do, you're still going to come up with poison. You know? So the police, the court system, the prisons, all poison. Uh, what we're going to do about it is up to, you know, the people. But um, that's, you know, I mean, we could walk through a litany of things like from 1919 or, you know, the height of lynching when two, two, uh, 2,000 people were lynched that year to 1920 when they passed the first death penalty so they wouldn't have to be just lynching people, you know? So death penalty is passed in. You can look and see who's on death row today. You know, so we see where things have gone. And Ralph, we talk about Ralph. Ralph still got a shackle around his leg right now, bracelet on his leg while he's out here. You know, can't participate in certain things. His voice is squashed. And it's always been that way. You know, that's why they pass laws to keep the so-called slaves from educating, reading and writing, right? You know, that's why any, whoever became a uh, so-called leader or was educating someone else to what's going down, they're, they're attacked and killed. That's what's going on in this country. So it's pretty much uh, up to the people you know, we have these these discussions and whatnot is hopefully that something, you know, people change comes about. People start like getting serious about like, um, you know, squashing this stuff. 
I mean, the prisoners showed, uh, you know, if you were here last night and you saw the film and whatnot, and when the prisoners ran Walpole, that they held the prison. Um, the guards walked out because they thought they were going to turn it into a bloodbath, right? But the prisoners flipped that on them <laughs> and, show, and showed them that, you know, we can live in peace and harmony together. You know, that's not what it's, you know, we're about. They're the ones that do the violence and expect people to just take it. But some people do, and some people don't. You know? um, so not everyone can uh, swallow as much as someone else. Um, some people draw the line a little closer, you know? And so anyways, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much the work we have to do. Thank you, know. you Ronnie. Th uh, sorry. Thank you, Brother Kazi. I really appreciate, I really appreciate, we all appreciate um, your contribution uh, over your lifetime, uh, your commitment to uh, revolution uh, over your lifetime, uh, and your remarks here today. Uh, so, and uh, thank you, thank you also for, for lifting up, again, two other names that have been, uh, were critical in the 1970s in linking communities to uh, those behind the bars, uh, Donna Finn and uh, John McGrath. John McGrath, of course, was the, once he got out of prison, mm -hmm. uh, was really critical in, um, in uh, forming uh, the family and, friend, family and Friends of Prisoners, Prisoners which right. was, again, a multiracial organization at a time uh, when there was deep racial division in the city of Boston. Um, this was an organization of um, uh, uh, sisters and brothers and mothers and fathers, mm -hmm. all of whom had to get out to Walpole, all of them who needed the transportation, had to work together to get the transportation to take care of their people who were behind bars. Uh, and so uh, mm -hmm. folks came together from Roxbury, South Boston, North End, uh, to form this organization uh, at a time uh, when uh, in other uh, contexts, um, those communities were at each other's teeth. It was an amazing, mm -hmm. an amazing formation. Um, so thanks so much for bringing, bringing that to the table as well. And I think we would be remiss if we didn't also mention the public officials uh, who were central to this story. Uh, John Boone, uh, also a visionary leader uh, who uh, came to Massachusetts dedicated to reform, uh, dedicated to transforming um, this prison system, uh, to uh, cleaning it up, literally, figuratively, and with a deep imagination and commitment. Uh, John Boone, who lit a fire under Francis, our governor then, Francis Sargent, Republican governor. Hey, boy, hey, folks, a Republican governor of this state who uh, was committed to uh, reform. Now, did he hit did he hit some bumps in the road? Did he take uh, turns that maybe could be criticized? Absolutely. He's a political leader. He's a governor of the state. Uh, but, but for Sergeant and Boone, we never would have had uh, furloughs. We never would have had educational programs in those prisons. Uh, we never would have had uh, expanded visitation. We never would have had the limited due process that we ultimately did get for folks uh, who were uh, locked up in segregation. All those things uh, came because of the united efforts of the folks pushing behind the bars, um, those who, were, uh, who couldn't get out, uh, and, and, and the leadership, uh, which, and John had to deal with um, not, just, uh, not, just the, not just the demands, the right, righteous and rightful demands made by prisoners, uh, but as well, uh, he had to situate himself uh, between the political leadership at the State House um, down in Boston, uh, the Guards Union, which was now, this is a period of time in which uh, the guards all across New England uh, were uh, feeling their muscle as workers and demanding as what they considered to be uh, rights as workers, right? Uh, and so there's uh, lots of contradiction in there because what they were demanding was more power to ru run the prisons, right? Uh, and they thought, that's the only way to protect our own safety is if we sit on the prisoners and drug the prisoners, mm. right? So all this is um, going on in an incredibly 
um, dynamic political situation here in Massachusetts, situated in a in, in some of some of you, I can I can look out there and see that some of you were alive during the 1970s. Not all of you. Yeah, I'm looking at you. Some of you, some of you, some of you were with us in the 1970s. And so uh, we recall, you know, what a pivotal moment that was uh, in our in the political life of our country. Right, um, the end of the war. Of the Nixon presidency, um, the death of the formal uh, civil rights movement, the formal movement that begins in the 1960s and, and really begins to dissipate with the death, um, as David said, um, the death of, uh, uh, and, and and Kazi said, uh, the death of King um, uh, and Malcolm. Uh, and so here we are, uh, we're moving into you know, new territory, the growth of the weather movement uh, in, in the uh, weather underground uh, in, the 19, in the 1970s, uh, and, and obviously as well uh, the enormous impact that the Black Panther Party uh, had uh, both within and outside the wall. So all of this is going, all this contestation, this fight for space, this fight for life, this fight for, you know, uh, for, for education, for health, uh, all of this is going on, uh, and all of it is being absorbed and reflected behind the walls. So um, this has been a really, a really, really dynamic, um, uh, dynamic uh, panel, um, and I thank all, all of our, all of our guests for their contributions. Uh, but now we want to also have as dynamic and as rich a conversation with those of you who are in our television audience. So, um, so the floor is, is open uh, for comment, uh, critique, questions. Tell us who you are. First of all, tell us who you are. I'm Bob Gadigan. I'm from uh, Boston University, uh, Department of Applied Social Sciences, uh, former director of the BU Prison Education Program, which also started in 1972 uh, at uh, Norfolk. And Arnie, uh, I have a Arnie, question. Arnie went to your school, I think, right, Arnie? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a couple of degrees. Very good, yeah. And uh, my, my question for anybody, but especially for, uh, for everybody, is, OK, so what were you reading, what were you thinking in the 1970s that you would say is still relevant today? What would you like people to know to read today to keep up with the situation? Wants to feel that. Okay, okay uh, my brothers. Uh, um, uh, we were reading. I was uh, uh, everything I could. Uh, <laughs> I mean, when I was locked up, I was reading now three books a week. But uh, you know, I I liked George Jackson. I liked uh, you know his prison letters. I liked Blood in My Eye, and uh, that was my Bible. Um. I would, I would join that. I would add to that, uh, as a Muslim, that uh, the Quran has always been helpful guidance and, and, a, and a source of strength and, and inspiration for, for those of, of that faith, and even those that were not, that were just friends, friends of Muslims. And I was trying to read some, a little bit of everything. I was trying to read a law book. Law books used to make me mad. Because <laughs> the first six pages, I'm free. Then I read four or five more pages down, I'm locked back up again. So I want to throw the book across the room. So I just could, I didn't have a good understanding of how to read a law book, and I still don't today. A law book and a Bible, I got problems with. Um, you know, so somebody always has to interpret for me what God said. And I'm saying, when the last time you talked to him? And so, uh, uh, no, let me come up with my own understanding. But there was a time when there was no TVs. There weren't no televisions, there weren't no radios. So everybody had to depend on something. Even the people who couldn't read looked at the pictures. So if I got like Native Son, uh, Richard Wright, I read Native Son, I said, oh, this is powerful. I give it to Kazi. Kazi passed it on to Jabir or to David. And we would pass that book around. What that did was that put us all on the same page because we all read the same thing. And we had a mutual understanding about you know, that, that book or, that, or what we got out of that book. And um, 
then of course, um, I guess they figured we had too much time on our hands, and 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 um, we lobbied for televisions, and first they said no, 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 and finally they said yeah, because there was a, uh, there's never enough jobs in prison. Like uh, Norfolk, right now is 1,500 people. There's not 1,500 jobs. There may be. 400 jobs, so the other 1,100 people are just fending for themselves. If they don't have families to send them money from home, or uh, you know, how do they survive? You get one roll of toilet paper a week. You may get one bar of soap a week, um, and you got to guard it with your life. Uh, but, you know that was then, and, and, and even now, you don't get toothpaste and toothpaste and stuff like that anymore. Um, I don't know why, because they got plenty of money. The DOC budget was $2.2 billion. $2 billion for some, and 85% of it went to the officers' salaries. 85% of $2.2 billion went to the officers. What about the inmates' food, inmates' clothes, inmates' programs, inmates' uh, training programs, whatever? There was really no money there for us, and everybody seemed to be all right with that. So, of course, we had to do the best we could. Hi, um, thank you so much for Tell being here. Are, hey, I'm Tasha Haverty, and uh, hi, Bob. I'm a journalist uh, that's been obsessed with the prison across the street for a long time at Norfolk and uh, learned about this amazing story a few years ago of what happened at Walpole, and I'm just uh, kind of vibrating with excitement to be able to ask you guys something. So I have a question about, um, D David, was the Phillips Brooks House uh, did you guys organize a lot of the civilian observers as well at the Phillips Brooks House, the, the Harvard grad students that got to come in during the Walpole uprising? I can't balance the fact that we uh, were really you know, part of that group. I think part of the communication, I think this um, comes out both in the books and other things that were said here was, you know, families and kind of what, what happened in terms of just how that was offered out to prisoners and then it got smacked up, smacked down in yeah. the long run in terms of uh, you know, who those observers were, the whole issue of the gender issues in terms of uh, females not being allowed to be part of observer groups at, at certain points in time. So, so, okay, well, so I guess my, my question for all mm -hmm. of you, but um, especially Albert, I guess, um, is if you can talk about during the time of the uprights, those two and a half months, the dynamics with the cadets that, that were there, because my understanding is a lot of those were black men that suddenly had any interest in being COs because of Boone. Suddenly you had men of color actually entering the system as potential guards. So I'm just curious what the dynamics there that, were. That sort of backfired because the prisoners lobbied and requested for um, black uh, people of color in staff positions. There weren't no black guards. There weren't no black counselors. There was no black case managers. There was no black dentist, doctor, or anything. So anyway, so all of our issues got dealt with somebody else who didn't really understand who we were. So we lobbied for them. And uh, first they were saying, nobody of color is applying for the positions, for the jobs. We knew that couldn't be true, or we thought it couldn't be true. And then when they did get some guys in, um, they, they would do, and the guys would talk to us, like the white guards talk to the white inmates. When, when these black cadets talk to us, they went out, the administration went out in the parking lot and ripped their cars apart. So they would come out off their shift and see their, their seats sitting in the parking lot. They were like, what's going on? So I, they were sending a message. So a lot of these um, uh, uh, guys quit the DOC and went to the registry because there was so much racism there. We're talking about during the period of the busing issue. Um, uh, uh, there, there was really, I mean, when Boone, when we got uh, John O'Boone, who was a dynamic, dynamite person, you know what the front page of the Record American said? Boone the coon. Yeah. That's what the Screws Union, the officers union called them. Boone the coon! And they would key his car, uh, do everything, they, despicable thing they could do to discourage this guy from coming into Walpole or whatever institution he was going into. And, and 
they wasn't even willing to give him a chance. And, and it seemed to me like, you know, his program was, you know, was innovative. You know, uh, he was way ahead of his time. He, uh, um, and quickly some people already in Massachusetts who was on this level gravitated towards him, like uh, Jerome Miller, like, um, 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 oh, I can't think of all the people, the many people that, you know, who had been waiting for this rehabilitation to really kick in or efforts to kick in. They said we were under the umbrella of rehabilitation, but it hadn't kicked in yet in terms of, you know, us actually seeing it. Um, I, I'm Ed Childs. I'm a labor organizer here on um, campus with the dining hall workers, um, and also a, a part of the Prison Solidarity Committee in the in the 70s. I I have a couple points and a question. Um, you just brought up in in the 70s when you went on strike. I was outside an organizer that they helped. They the prisoners asked to help. Um, negotiate at Conklin Prison. When I got out of the negotiations, I went to the parking lot, and my car was shredded. Yeah, just like you said, my back seat was on the other side of the um, parking lot, and the wire's all gone. So yeah, that's the intensity. But I also want to explain how intense this period was. You mentioned Boston. Um, you know, Boston was this last city, major city in the country to integrate the schools. And <clears throat> that in the, in the 72, when the, the court decision was made, 73, the whole police department of Boston, which also was the last to integrate in the country, voted not to protect black children. That was the vote. The vote was not to protect protect black children, and they didn't. That's why they had to call in state troopers. Um, that's the intensity that was going on. Um, that, <clears throat> but the point I want to make, too, is I was a labor organizer, young at that time, just starting out. But one reason I started out, because what was happening in the prisons. Mm -hmm. You were a huge inspiration. As today, people say Starbucks and Amazon is an inspiration. Well, the prisons at that time was an inspiration. The, prison, the union movement started to go down after the McCarthyite period and started to come back up because of the prison movement. That's how significant this is. And that's why the repression was so heavy. And when you started the union, one thing we tried to do in the union movement here was to say, hey, AFL-CEO, incorporate them in. But it wasn't the prison guards union but it was outside the political movement, both the Democrats and Republicans, forcing the AFL-CIO not to touch it. We had a hard time in the union movement trying to bring the prison union in to, to the movement, because you were such an inspiration. So that's my question. I organize outside in the, in the unions, like the dining hall workers here. It's very difficult. Inside, you're such an inspiration. We would like some manuals, some stories of how you organized inside. You touched a little bit about Ralph Hamm. And I talked to Ralph Hamm back that, at that time. But that's, that's an amazing thing, how you organized inside. And that's not publicized, because that, that would be an inspiration to organizers in the unions today. Thanks. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to ask this gentleman over here to uh, say something. Tell us who you are and tell us a little bit about your experiences. Uh, This, uh, this gentleman here was asking about books. I, I send books into prisoners down to Virginia today. And uh, some of the books that I found most effective 
are books like Albert Woodfox's book, Solitary, The 1619 Project, and uh, one that I just recently sent in, Stamped from the Beginning by Ibram X. Kendi. That's, that's getting a lot of, uh, you know, the, the books that I send in are passed from hand to hand. I'm sending books into six prisons in Virginia now. It started off with, uh, with an article that was written about me in the, in the Richmond Magazine, and a woman prisoner read it, and uh, she wrote me a letter thanking me for what I had done 50 years ago. And, you know, we got talking back and forth in letters, and uh, I, I was asking her about books. Like, one book I was reading at the time was Our Class by Chris Hedges. And... Uh, Asked her if it was in the prison library. Prison libraries don't have books like that, you know? So I sent it to her. And I had, she started passing it around. So we had the idea of these little mini freedom libraries where, you know, you send a book into a prisoner and they read it. And when they're reading it, they think about who around them might get something out of that book. And they pass it, pass it and, and the books circulate like that. Right now, I got like 120 books, like the ones I'm talking about, circulating in these prisons down in Virginia. It's, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the way I'm doing it, so. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And I didn't want, I didn't want to lose this gentleman's um, question uh, about what prison organizing in the 1970s could uh, teach those who were trying to organize in uh, places, spaces that seem unorganizable um, today. So the question here is if it could be done then in these most uh, difficult circumstances, uh, what lessons uh, can we draw from that uh, that would both inspire and teach organizers today? I, well, I'm gonna I, let, yes, yes, vote. I think one thing, just to, I wanted to say something about that. Margaret, um, I think it was just uh, yeah, just like uh, what, what Fred was doing when he started the Rainbow Coalition. You know, he was the one that started that in Chicago. I think a lot of that was going on in, in, inside, like where Bobby was organizing a lot of the white prisoners, and um, you know, Ralph was organizing a lot of black prisoners. And if there had been a different uh, mix inside, they would have probably found people to reach out to those different people also you know, and come together uh, recognizing that they have the same common enemy um, th through oppression. And, um, you know, uh, what um, my man was saying, when he raised about rehabilitation, you know, it was never intended. You know, the system's running perfectly well <laughs> the way they have it set up for them, for capitalism, imperialism, white supremacy. So, you know, um, they never really... That was just a, you know, a hoodwink thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Say to the public, you know, the, the rehabilitation, we need all this money, shift it to the guards, prisoners get nothing. Right, yeah, so. Okay. Um, I, would, I would just like to offer, I mean, we often hear the, 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 the phrase that, uh, that the, the behavior of, of, of prison officials were about job security, um, which it was, but, um, there were, there were offshoots of that, uh, the, the, the impact of, of, of what that was. For example, uh, as I stated earlier, uh, Chapter 777 gave birth to the whole concept of rehabilitation and, and allowed us the opportunity to re rehabilitate ourselves in spite of the efforts of the DOC. Now, at that time, there was a furlough program, as was mentioned by, by Margaret, Prisoners was allowed to have avocations, which meant that they had their own businesses, they could be creative and make their own money and all the rest of that. Those two things allowed fathers and husbands to, re to remain active in the lives of their families and to be able to make meaningful contributions to, to their families, to support their families from behind the walls and like that and raise their children and so forth. And all. When this new era was ushered in, um, all of that went up in smoke. And so the, the consequences of, of God's striving for job security 
also resulted in the destruction of families. Um, it, it, it took away our, our ability to, to remain, actively remain a part or the heads of our households as fathers and husbands and like that, and, and, and place that burden on, on the mothers and, and like that. That's just one of the, 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 the side effects of, of, of that new era ushering that came with uh, Governor Well, who decided that he wanted to reintroduce prisoners to the joys of Bustin' Rocks, his language. I just wanted thanks. to thanks. note that. Um, th thanks, for, thanks for that contribution, uh, Jabir. Uh, and what I would add is that the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> uh, NPRA, uh, in the intent of the NPRA was to nurture a uh, working consciousness w among prisoners that pr that so prisoners could could see themselves as people whose work uh, was valuable uh, and should be uh, and should be and that they should be paid uh, for what the work for the work that they were producing those license plates on your cars where do you think they came from right uh, so uh, so. Just think, thinking about uh, getting prisoners to think about themselves not just not just as inmates, not just as folks doing time, not just as folks in dead time, as it were, uh, but to think about themselves uh, through with uh, with with the consciousness of workers. And you know, there's a contradiction in that, of course, because in part, prisons today are you know they're they're extractive. You know, and they're extracting as much as they can from inmates, and um, Albert mentioned mentioned that, right? Uh, and not only are they extractive, but they are um, warehousing folks who would otherwise be involved in different forms of work, right? So both things are happening, but in that context in the 1970s, when, um, as this gentleman pointed out, um, the labor, labor movement was on the rails across the country, right? Uh, this notion that uh, labor uh, could find a, a space and could find a definition, uh, rebirth, in, within prisons uh, was really brand new. And it started in Rhode Island in the ACI, which was this impossible institution in uh, compete in ev on every level with Walpole. Right, all the worst features of Walpole they had in Rhode Island. And that's where the NPR, NPRA started and quickly spread to Walpole and elsewhere around the country. Skip. Yes. Um, no, go ahead. I don't want you to lose your thought. another mentor. Oh, thank you. Also blessed another mentor, um, Janet Connors, who is a member of the Families and Friends of Prisoners. Um, I'm a community transformative justice practitioner. I work, work mostly with people who cause harm in response to sexual violence. And my question for you all is, um, what do you need from us as a younger generation to support you um, and carry forward this movement to imagine a society, create a society without prisons first to listen mm. uh, to 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 take the lessons that that we've learned seriously um, too often generations want to think independently they tend to think if we're going to do it our way the old way is is gone and so forth and like that uh, but as as my brother Albert often says uh, for those that does not examine and take history seriously, they're destined to repeat the mistakes of it. Um, and so that would be my request, that they, they take their lessons that, that we left behind seriously and come to us for the guidance and not just draw their own conclusions based on someone else's input. Down the line there? Some little, well, basically, you know, he who listens knows everything. Some people sit back in the background and just observe and watch and listen. Everything. 
looking at it from the outside, you see what everybody was saying. At it. So he who listens knows everything. Like he said, listen. Listen and observe. Trust your gut. Trust your gut. Um, that's, that comes from our nature. Nature being the root word of natural. Our, it's there for a reason. When the hair stand up on the back of your neck, that's telling you something. When you get that feeling, that's telling you something. Don't ignore it. You know, and um, stay in the light. Be all right. Uh, and I'll add on to it. I would say, uh, you know, that when you hear these catchy phrases about, you know, strike three year out, when you see the politicians talking about Corey laws, because they pass laws to stop uh, people who have a, a felony conviction of getting a job, you know. <laughs> So people coming out, they can't get a job, they can't work. And if you're in for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, 40 years, and you made nothing to go into Social Security, when you come out, you get nothing. So people, you know, and then you can't get a job. So, you know, organize your people, man, to, uh, to not listen to these politicians when they start coming out with, you know, we got to keep these people down, you know, prisons get nothing, you know, organize your people and talk to your people to uh, not listen to that garbage. Yeah, I don't, I don't want that to get, uh, Kanzi's point on that, to get lost, because when people come out, they have nothing, literally nothing, no money, no home, no food no health care, no benefits. They come out with nothing and are, uh, you know, it's bit by bit, there have been some efforts here in Massachusetts to change that picture, but not enough. And so we lose people. Uh, if they, if, if, even if they survive, even if they are able to survive and not get locked up again, their spirit is crushed. They cannot get a job. And so, that, so that, that has to be part of the picture. That has to be a critical part of the picture. I would also add to, to, to your question that, that people should always be vigilant and observant of the fact that, that the behavior of the powers that be doesn't change. It's, all, it's been consistent pretty much throughout, throughout, throughout history. I began by sharing with you that my introduction to the prison system was being shot by, by the police in the back and charged with assault and battery on him. Uh, today in the news, you can see the police beating up a young lady and they charged her with assault and battery on him. Uh, so anybody that's been watching the news lately in the last couple of days, um, this young lady supposedly been, was unruly and they had to remove her and so you have this cop punching her in the face. Uh, and she was charged. She was arraigned this morning, I believe it was, with assault and battery on him. Uh, so the behavior, the pattern doesn't change. It, it, it generally works for them, and they're consistent in, the, in their behavior. So when people see those kind of consistencies and the contradictions that come with it, I think it's worth observing. You, you know, I may add, you know, I have a concern today. I don't know how, how, how many of you saw the commercial or um, advertisement about they're looking for new officers and they're willing to drop the age down to 19. So anybody 19 year old uh, who's 19 years old can go and become a correction officer. Now, he's 19, he's not even 21. And um, get full benefits um, because they, uh, they, they, there's a demand for Correctional officers. Now, the last 30 years, the number one occupation in America was prison guard or case managers. Or uh, um, now, if these people are going to come in and help, I don't. Uh, somebody told me a long time ago that the Quakers invented prisons to help people, not to do what they're doing. Well, somebody dropped the ball because they haven't been helping people. You know, you put somebody in a cage. He's already in a cage in a room, a steel room with nothing but steel and concrete in it. 
Then you put chains on him while he's in the room. The door is locked. You're already in a prison with a wall, with electric wire, with guns. Why is this guy got chains on? So now, there's three things that happen morning, noon, and night in every prison in, in Massachusetts. Medication time. So you got this line for people who are lining up on psychotropic drugs because their heads are so messed up for being chained up and locked in a room by themselves with no book. Oh, yeah, they got one book, a Bible. But the light is way up in the ceiling with a box over it so you can't get to it. So it's really dim. So you're trying to read this book because it's the only thing you got. And you start hearing voices. They call it sens sensory deprivation. And it, Bobby did a, uh, a big thing about trying to lobby to do away with these um, segregation, segregation uh, uh, units. Segregation so units. a lot of the mental health is manufactured there by how people are treated. Amen. And then Amen. on top of that, like we said, uh, God didn't make prisons. Man made prisons. Prison is an abnormal environment but they're asking you to be normal in this abnormal environment. And they're treating you inhumanely, criminally, and sometimes really, 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 really bad. So a lot of guys are medicating themselves just to, to try to get rid of that reality or, or get through that day. It's not that they're the inmates are all drug addicts. They don't want to be drug addicts. They don't even want to be there, but they want to be able to get through it because nobody's bringing no concern, nobody's bringing no, 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 um, no help. Everybody's crying out for help, crying out for help, crying out for help. And I, and I could go in the yard, a big, big, huge yard, and just stand in the yard and yell, and I'm a singer, and everybody knows I'm a singer. So I can go in the yard and start singing. Next thing I know, I'm surrounded by five of them. It's gonna take me to the loony bin. Why? Because I'm singing in the yard by myself? Whoa. How about I was talking to God? Y'all got a problem with that? Yes. <laughs> Lock you in a room. And then have somebody come and say, have you had any voices this morning? Uh, how are you feeling? I said, listen, I was talking to God. Can I talk to God? <laughs> what is wrong? I can only talk to God in church. I can't talk to, you know, so... Um, these young people who are gonna, these 19 year old people who are gonna go in as the professionals today, I don't think they're gonna treat people too well because uh, I've seen people who came from good homes with good parents and good values and things and good morals, but still come to the prison and change and dehumanize other people because they can. Not because they did anything, but because they can. That ain't right. We don't, we don't need them type of people in there. People need help, people need to be fixed. And if you're not going to fix us, then stop with the hypocrisy and, 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 and let the public know it. I mean, they're not going to let you know because you're paying a whole bunch of money to keep us there. The taxpayer's dollar. But you don't know that your dollar is being robbed and we're not being fixed. And 99.9% .9 of them people returning to the, the different neighborhoods and commu communities are going to come back worse than they were than they came. You know? You know what? I think Albert has taken us full circle. <laughs> and it's a, unless there's an urgent question or comment, I think it's, it's a really good space to stop. And, 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 and we can continue these conversations in small groups, in smaller groups. But, but I, I want us to keep his words uh, close and uh, let them... Let them speak for this workshop. I think, thank you so much, Al.